Quackaholics Anonymous uh, oftentimes talks about being humble. Uh, they often have topics in their meetings about humility. They often speak about being and living humbly. But is there anything actually remotely humble about Quackaholics Anonymous, the steps, or the traditions? Is there any practice of humility in any kind of uh, rational application in life uh, that exists in what they're teaching? Why don't we find out? I don't think I actually have to uh, reiterate the behavior of people in meetings uh, for this particular video. I've done that quite enough in the prior videos, the behavior, the blatant hypocrisy, uh, the whole entire attitude of what it seems that AA does to people who are in it for a long period of time. I mean, there's nothing humble about them. I don't think that I need to go into personal anecdotes uh, about people like a pile of shit sponsor and all of them. Uh, and some of the statements they make about, you know, God's grace uh, as a prime example of arrogance. But I was looking uh, overall at the actual program and the actual steps and the actual literature. Normally I avoid the literature like the plague. Uh, and in fact, the only time I can ever look at excerpts uh, of it is when I'm on the Irish Papers website, which I was actually looking at a couple of days ago when I had... Uh, kind of a short day at work. I'm actually in the middle of a new job right now and I'm working like 60, 70 hours a week. And uh, I haven't had a lot of time to argue with a lot of quackaholics online, even though uh, that's not exactly a bad thing, I don't think. But uh, I started thinking about, uh, and I don't remember exactly what it was, something I read, something I overheard uh, that was talking about you know, humility, I don't even think it has anything to do with the program. I think it was kind of uh, in a totally unrelated matter, but it got me to thinking about how many meetings they've had to sit through where they talk about humility and being humble and all this other stuff. And uh, I started kind of glancing around the orange papers. Uh, the link I have to it, I'll post it at the bottom of this video when I, uh, when I get done uploading it. Uh, is an archive version. I don't know if the, the website itself is actually up online at the moment or not. I know the, the last time I had uh, I had heard anything about the guy that does the website, I don't know him personally, I don't know his name or anything like that, uh, that he wasn't able to actually uh, upload anything new or, or something was going on. I know the site was down for a little while and you know now it seems to be, I heard it was back up and running, but the archive links I've got is pretty much uh, all the information you need when it comes to uh, seeing the cult for what it is. In fact, uh, the Irish Papers site itself was really quite instrumental uh, to me, not at the time when I first discovered it, uh, because at the time I was still going to Quackaholics Anonymous meetings, but it, it kind of started planting doubt. Uh, doubts that I already had, I should say. I, I was already kind of questioning, you know, the whole entire quasi-religious pseudo-crap, pseudo-spiritual crap I was hearing day in and day out in there, but it was kind of a, kind of just a couple of salient points that he, you know, had pointed out on, on the site itself that got me to thinking. Uh, one of the first ones I remember that, that stuck was, uh, Whenever he said, you know, whenever you're doing good, it gets all the credit. Whenever you screw up, all of a sudden it's all your fault. Which, come to think of it, to tie it in with the topic, it's a little bit arrogant of, of AA to selectively pick and choose how it wants to present itself. In other words, it, it, it uh, makes this grandiose claim that it saved millions of people, but it, it, it stays completely silent on anything harmful about it. If you notice... Uh, when you're in, you know, meetings or anything like that, I mean, if you criticize the program, if you rock the boat, if you make waves, if you uh, say the big book is full of shit or something like that, you're pretty much setting yourself up to be ostracized. You're pretty much setting yourself up to to really be relegated to the, you know, to the position of where they can sit around and hush tones and say he's not going to be here very long. He's going to get drunk and die. Uh, doesn't sound very humble to me. You know, they, they claim that the... What is that horse shit they, they have in the, the We Agnostics chapter? Oh yeah, the, the realm of the spirit is all inclusive. Now they claim it's all inclusive, but it's very obvious to anybody, I think, with half a brain, 
that is very exclusive. Uh, primarily, of course, all you got to do is say the right lingo to fit in. If As long as you're saying the right lingo that sounds good, they don't really care what kind of a scumbag you really are. But it's a little bit arrogant, I would think, when I look at the overall steps to think that you can just... Uh, you can just say, I fucked my entire life up, and now I'm going to turn it over to uh, this group of drunks, and they're going to run it all for me, and my problems are all going to be fixed. Uh, the guy that you encounter in the AA 12-step groups is almost like organized crime. I mean, I'll go to meetings, and I'll, uh, and I'll praise you, and I'll be your mouthpiece because I can speak for you on your behalf. You know, I, I think right there I can also add that it's pretty arrogant. Uh, to call yourself a mouthpiece of a creator of the universe or whatever it is, you know, it was something I used to think about uh, often is like, well, if there is this spirit of the universe they're always running their mouth about, what does he need you for? I mean, I would literally hear people uh, going on and on and on about, you know, God wanted me to do this, God wanted me to go there, God wanted this to happen for me, God wanted that to happen for me, uh, God put a drunk in my life that relapsed and killed himself so I could stay sober. I mean, it's a very narcissistic way of looking at the whole entire world at large. I mean, to think that some power out there just waits on you hand and foot because you go to beatings and, and, and blabber a whole lot of 12-step garbage, uh, all of a sudden there's some mysterious force that's going to grant you every wish and is going to do your bidding and is going to uh, solve all your problems. Now what they really mean by solve all your problems is it will protect your quackaholic reputation. Uh, most of the old timers and old whiners, as I call them, you know, they live totally fucked up lives. They're only sick. Their only claim to fame is being able to sit in meetings and run their mouth for how great God is because God does everything for them, which is not really very humble. I mean, you know, I've heard people brag about how God gives them, you know, parking spaces. Uh, I've seen people say, uh, you know, I got this interview today and, and it just so happened I knew the guy and I looked at the universe and I said, God, you know, you've given me, you know, this is a God thing and everything. It, it really seems awful self-centered to, uh, to live your whole life believing that the whole entire universe and the whole entire world revolves around you. Uh, that everything that happens in your life correlates directly to some mystical AA deity that is constantly removing your desire to drink, provided, you know, you just keep uh, blabbing uh, his message, in, you know, in the meetings, which is really kind of funny. I mean, you know, when you think about the people who are engaged in 13 step in, and you think about the people who are some old whiners that I knew that actually dealt drugs at meetings or the ones who spread people's fifth steps around in meetings and ruined their reputations and ruined their lives. Apparently the AA deity doesn't care if you do those kinds of things. You know, it's okay to prey on people. It's okay to steal from people. It's okay to fuck people over. But AA deity doesn't have any problem with that whatsoever. The only problem the AA deity seems to have with is if you take a drink. Other than that, you know, you're free to, you're free to do whatever. It, you know, you've got protection points kicked up to the grand mob boss in the sky. You know, which uh, the protection racket scheme. I'll go to meetings and I'll run my mouth and then I'll be protected for the rest of my life and all my problems will be solved and God will wait on me hand and foot. Uh, whenever I wanted to. I remember this one old douchebag, I guess I'll use the term, uh, used to say, I used to worry, what if God doesn't care about me? Well, you know, to take a really uh, hardline approach there, is there any reason why something should wait on you hand and foot for the rest of your life, uh, removing your character defects? Well, appearing like it removed your character defects, you know, the the, uh, the the abhorrent behavior speaks for itself, but is there any reason why some mystical power should wait on you hand and foot because you've stopped picking up a bottle, uh, or because you're sitting in a meeting every day, is there some, is there some law, some contract, some guarantee in the, in the, in the universe that, uh, that whatever it is out there is just going to drop everything it's doing and spend all of its spare time talking to you and speaking through you because you didn't pick up a bottle today. I mean, you know, it, uh, there, there's, I don't see really a humble attitude there. I mean, you know, uh, like I said, with the parking spaces, I remember some guy saying, you know, I needed 
be at this appointment real fast. And uh, uh, there was a front parking space. I looked up at this guy and I said, that was a sign. That was a God thing. So well, let me get this straight. Like, you know, maybe there's a guy who's got, uh, I don't know, uh, chronic pain or a disability that might need the close parking space to get into the office. Or maybe there's a pregnant lady that's looking for a parking space that might need to get into the office. Or maybe there's an employee running late. But out of all the hundreds of thousands of possibilities for why someone might need a front parking space, God deliberately altered the laws of reality and nature just to get you that parking space because you haven't had a drink in a long time. Yeah, that all adds up as an example of humble living. When you really think about it, uh, the whole step three idea that you turn your will and your life over to the care of, you know, uh, kind of has a bit of a Santa Claus, I don't know, Christmas wish list to it. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's more or less like a, a little kid that goes out and creates a, an entire ruckus and gets himself in all sorts of trouble and then tells his parents, uh, well, you know, I can't do this. Uh, I can't run my own life anymore, mom and dad. You're going to have to run it for me. I mean, I'm just totally flawed. I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. And I'm going to humbly ask you to run my life. I'm going to humbly ask you to remove everything that I'm doing wrong. I'm not going to take responsibility for it because I'm, I'm spiritually sick. You just got to do it for me. And then you send uh, your parents a wish list by saying, you know, this is the exact nature of my wrongs. This is my moral inventory. And now I'm going to get on my knees. And I'm going to just tell you, you got to do it for me. See, I'm just telling you, you know, I'm not even going to try anymore. You got to do it for me, you know. And I'll, I'll even go around and make a few grandiose amends to some people here and there. And I'll recruit more people to love you. You know, I'll go out in the streets and I'll get some people to come to my house and talk about what great parents you are. And I'll give you... Uh, an article in Time Magazine or something like that, just provided that you run my life for me every hour of every moment of every day, because if you stop running my life for every hour of every moment of every day, well, I'll just kill myself with alcohol, you know, because I didn't turn it over well enough. It, it, it's a kind of a, an arrogant demand there. It's kind of like the whole uh, humbly asking to remove our shortcomings situation. I mean, wait a minute. You know, in a, in a job I work at, I'm required to work by myself a lot, and I'm required to kind of think on my own. I'm, I'm required to troubleshoot and problem solve on my own. Uh, maybe I should just go to work one morning and let the whole thing fall apart and fuck everything up and let everything just get into utter disarray, and then I'll go to my boss and I'll say, I'm entirely ready for you to remove the mess that I made at this job today and run my life for me because I'm humbly asking you on my knees to do it. I just can't do it. <laughs> I mean, here's another interesting idea that uh, I, I guess it never occurs to them in Quackaholics Anonymous. I mean, what if, what if the spirit of the universe, whatever, says, look, you fucked all this up. I mean, you got to fix it. I gave you a brain to fix it. Then what happens? Uh, what happens if he doesn't feel like hearing your Christmas list every day, day in and day out, your demands, even though you're saying, I'm humbly asking you, you know, is it, is it kind of like a, kind of like a crooked politician leaning on the ear of a lobbyist and says, I'm, I'm humbly asking you, you know, solve this, this cr criminal problem for me and I'll, I'll support you in the election. <laughs> doesn't sound very humble to me. It doesn't sound very, uh, it doesn't sound like humility, certainly. It sounds like a, a very, it sounds like a three-year-old kid that's, that's throwing a temper tantrum and saying, unless you make me cookies, I'm going to, I'm going to break all my toys. That's what it sounds like to me overall. You know, about a, about a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was, I happened to catch a, the old film from the 80s. It was called Drugstore Cowboy. Uh, I had seen it a long time ago when I was, you know, I was pretty young in 1989, so I didn't really pay much attention to it at the time. I rewatched it because, well, probably because I'm a fan of Kelly Lynch more than anything else. But uh, there's an ending scene near the end, you know, for those aren't familiar with the plot, this guy makes a living robbing drugstores and taking everything. And uh, at some point after one of the addicts that's hanging out with him dies from a drunk overdose, he... He goes through a crisis trying to hide the body, and he goes through an even bigger crisis trying to bury the body without the police finding him. And, of course, he straightens up at the end. And, you know, typical kind of quackaholic twist to it, to be honest. But there's a scene where uh, the main character, Matt Dillon, is talking uh, to Kelly Lynch, and he says, 
You know, when she was dead and she was up there in the attic and we were surrounded by police, I just looked up and I said, God, spirit, demon, whatever you are, if you'll just help me get out of this situation, I'll go to rehab. And you know that, and of course, you know, that he supposedly cleans up because of God got him out of that situation. So that really, to me, sums up the behavior or the ideal of, of Crackaholics Anonymous pretty simply. I mean, here you got a guy, you know, who's, who's got someone who was trying to prove themselves is exactly why they ended up overdose. And they were trying to show I'm just as much of a drug addict as the rest of you guys who treat me like a two-year-old. Uh, you got an underage girl who ends up getting her hands on a, on a bad batch of drugs and overdoses, and your only your only single thought process is I gotta conceal this body and not get caught, and in turn God's gonna let me get sober and live a wonderful life. Uh, you know, you would think that I don't know maybe if there was some kind of spirit of the universe or something like that, it would be a little bit less concerned about, you know, I'll get you out of this situation provided you sit in quackaholic anonymous meetings and stay sober. I mean, I don't know, maybe it might uh, want you to contact a girl's parents. Maybe it might want you to actually do the right thing in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, letting the police know at least that, you know, this person drug overdosed or, or any number of ways you can handle it. Or any number of things that you and the people that are involved in the situation with you could have done. Uh, instead, you're more concerned about being able to pretty much abandon everyone and run the rehab. And God's going to protect you from doing that. Uh, by burying a body in the woods uh, that will never be found and nobody will ever know what happened to. And, you know, who cares if anybody's worried about it? Who cares about the fact that that was kind of a criminal thing to do? And who cares about you know, the legality of it, not to mention the right and wrong implications of it, not to mention, you know, I don't like using the word morals because I'm not really, I don't, you know, for whatever reason, but let's ignore all of that. Let's just look at the fact that God is going to get you sober as long as you run to rehab and he'll let you get away with criminal, with crime. <laughs> that sums up the whole entire attitude of a lot of AA people because, you know, I've heard those kinds of stories before. I've heard people say, you know, well, I was at my lowest point and Everything was all destroyed, and, and I asked uh, whatever it was up there to bail me out of this situation, and I would do good, and I would give him all the credit for it. I mean, it sounds, again, like some kind of mafioso situation where you run to the guy, you know, you run to the boss at the last second, and you say, look, I fucked this whole entire thing up. I mean, people are dead, people are hurt, people are screwed over, but if you make these problems go away, I'll, I'll make you a lot of money. In AA's case, it means that you'll make a lot more cult members by cult recruiting. Uh, that's another comical thing about the whole haven't had spiritual awakening. Well, you know, I don't know what sort of spiritual awakening you're having because to me, a spiritual awakening uh, doesn't involve being being wallowing in guilt and helplessness and and hopelessness for the rest of your life while waiting on and demanding some creator in the universe to do everything for you. That doesn't sound like a, a, a spiritual awakening to me. I mean, uh, maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm just looking at it all wrong. But that's not what I get out of spiritual awakening. Is sitting around being hopeless and uh, letting God solve all your problems and not accomplishing anything in life and not trying to do anything in life uh, because He's in charge. Uh, while you proceed to go about doing whatever immoral, vile type of thing that you wish, so long as you don't take a drink. As long as you don't take a drink in AA, you're qualified as someone who's had a spiritual awakening. You know, I've mentioned that before that there are people that will say, well, so-and-so may be screwing newcomers, and he may be taking advantage of treatment center girls, and he may be dealing pills and Xanaxes to uh, vulnerable people on the streets that come in here looking for a connection, but he hasn't had a drink in 25 years. That sounds really humble. That sounds really, you know, like a spiritual awakening. I mean, I want to be like that guy. You know, <laughs> um, the uh, I'm, I'm protected because, you know, after all, I didn't take a drink and I didn't do a drug, so therefore I have a license to screw people over and do what I wish, uh, and I'm going to be protected because I humbly told him to protect me. You know, I humbly on my knees said, "You're going to have to give me." A protection racket for the rest of my day so long as I spread your message. Um, 
Yeah, that's the definition of humility. That's the definition of being humble. If you look that up in the dictionary, I'm sure that's exactly what you would read. Uh, is, and, you know, when you have to talk for 45 minutes about humility, it's, it's kind of an indicator that you don't have a lot of it. Anyway, that's about all for this one. This is going to be kind of a short one. But, yeah, uh, I don't think uh, with further closer examination, there's anything humble about the entire program or anything about the 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 whole entire overall message. The whole overall message is is I'm a piece of shit. I'm a piece of shit that wants to be great in life. So I'll be great in life by lording it over on new people who don't understand uh, how to follow my rules and how to suck up to me and how to kiss my ass and let them tell me how how they need what I have, they want what I have, and they're willing to go to any length to get it. And I can do all those things as long as I don't take a drink because God is in charge of my life and he's just making me a wonderful uh, uh, crowned king of Quackaholics Anonymous. Think about that for a bit. doesn't make sense. Anyway, I'll see you guys next week if I'm not too busy working.